Well, hi everyone. It's an interesting experience to be given a lecture in Trinity again. I did some lectures to uh, medical students in what, 1986 or 1987, and I haven't given a lecture since, so we'll see how it goes. <laughs> um, Thank you. So my title is Research in the Public Interest. Um, please feel free to contact me either by email or Twitter. And what I'd like to cover um, is these points. I'd like to say a little bit about the mission of annual reviews, which uh, uh, informs why we're doing what we're doing, uh, how that mission provides us with an imperative for action, <coughs> and the actions that we are taking to transform annual reviews from an uh, um, organization that's aimed primarily for the benefit of the scholarship community. I was going to say scientific, but I've learned that already, that it, and it's true, it's the scholarship community, to being more of a public good. Uh, one, the, the major aspect of that, that we're focusing on at the, mo at the moment is to move our titles to open access, and I want to describe the subscribe to open program that we are using to do that, which I think is potentially very helpful for a large fraction of um, scholarly publishing to move to open access. Uh, annual reviews on its own is obviously a very tiny and almost insignificant part of the um, scholarly output, but if we can do something that uh, creates a model that can be used more widely, then I think that that's useful. I'd also like to talk a little bit about engaging with the public, which I think is important for all of us to do. And I've given everyone a copy of a magazine that Annual Reviews produces called Knowable. There's a website of the same name that is intended to bring uh, scientific information to the wider community. And I should say that that's done without using any funds that are generated from library subscriptions. We have a fairly clear um, uh, f financial wall between using library subscriptions to pay for the journals, and then these other activities in the public good, which we are funding in different ways, and I can discuss those ways if you're interested. And we're very interested in involving um, people outside of academia, policymakers, professionals, uh, people from industry and funders in a series of events to better understand how science can, how scholarship can impact society. And we also want to move towards facilitating community involvement through knowledge action networks that link these groups, that link academics with people in the professions, um, in industry and, and in funding. I won't say so much about the last three of those, I'll focus mostly on subscribe to, subscribe to open. So this is the mission of annual reviews in context. The mission is that annual reviews is a non-profit publisher dedicated to synthesizing and integrating knowledge for the progress of science and the benefit of society. And the surrounding is the context. Uh, the planet is ablaze, literally in some places. Actually, um, we got here on Wednesday afternoon and on Wednesday evening there was a blackout in the city that I live in, in the Bay Area. Um, uh, it's kind of proactive step to make sure that there wasn't a um, uh, wildfire started um, because there's high winds in the area. Lots of the power lines are being brought down causing these wildfires. And the solution at the moment seems to be, well, everyone will just go without power for as long as it's windy. I'm not sure that that's sustainable, but that's what they're doing at the moment. <laughs> so it's another good reason for us to be happy to be, uh, to be in, in Dublin. Um, as well as that, the rest of the planet is slowly being submerged um, by the uh, melting of the ice cap. And actually outside the library, there's a really nice exhibition of students responding to uh, global change. As well as that, democracy is in crisis and practical reason is under threat. I happen to have passports for a UK passport and a US passport, so I'm only too well aware of the the threat to democracy and the, um, the very real um, impact that it's having on, on practical reason and how practical reason is, is driving or not driving society. Closer in, I think that there are a lot, there's a lot of turmoil in academia, various types of turmoil. I don't think we could call it a crisis at the moment, but there's certainly a lot to, to think about. And um, 
scientific journalism, I think, is already more or less scorched earth. There's not really enough effort going into um, in, into telling the lessons from scholarship to the wider public. So I think that in the in in the light of this environment, we all have to respond in um, appropriate ways and. This is the imperative for action and, and our response, annual reviews response to these challenges. First of all, scientific information, scientific evidence or scholarship in general informs many of the issues that society is grappling with today. I believe that a functional democracy requires that everyone, policy makers, practitioners of all, of all sorts and citizens themselves have access to the knowledge and wisdom of the world's leading scholars. Annual Reviews captures um, knowledge and wisdom across 51 fields of research um, in the physical sciences, in biological sciences, life sciences, and the social sciences. We don't have any humanities titles, um, but in all scientific areas, we, we cover and, and provide um, uh, really high quality, believable reviews of what's going on in science. I think it's appropriate that we make this information available in relevant venues and relevant formats for as many different groups to use as possible. I've just put a quote here from a professor at the University of California that annual reviews is the most compact, accessible and usable, usable archive of the intellectual history of the sciences and social sciences in the world, a milestone of human intellectual achievement. I hope that's as much advertising for any reviews that I give here. I like, I like uh, that she said that, and and I agree with it. Um, so let me talk a bit about open access publishing and the impact of open access publishing. What this graph shows is the usage of our of three of our um, biomedical journals. Um, over a period of time, I think that's um, May 2016, I can see it better on here, through to September 2019. And the three journals are in three different colours. The blue is the annual review of clinical psychology, orange is annual review of medicine, and the grey line is the annual review of public health. You can see, if you squint really um, carefully at it, you can see that clinical psychology and medicine are trending upwards. There's this annual... Um, uh, reduction in the summertime, but overall we can see a small increase in the usage of those two journals. Um, they're uh, subscribed to by around about 12 to 1500 uh, institutions in the world, um, the leading institutions of scholarship in the world, if I can put it like that. And the grey line um, takes a different route. It was already a bit higher in terms of usage, but in May of 2017, um, which is uh, about a quarter of the way along there, we opened up the annual review of public health for everyone to read. And we did that with a grant. We used a grant from the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation to replace the income that we would have received from libraries. The libraries were charged uh, for that journal that year because we wanted to see whether there was any impact of open access. This is the growth of usage. At the moment, it stands at about eight times the number of um, downloads that we were getting before the journal was opened. And I think that in November and October and November of this year, October and November are, are the months where we get the most usage of our content. I, I suspect it will go up to 10 times the amount of usage that we were getting beforehand. <clears throat> yeah. um, and, and we know these are not just random downloads of the articles. We use an app to look at how far people scroll through the articles um, as a measure of how much value they're getting from it. And there's really essentially no change in how far people are scroll scrolling through the articles. So it's not a bunch of robots uh, downloading the articles. They're, they're, they're real people really reading this stuff. Um, a lot of the readership is in academic institutions, but some of it isn't. And these are some of the types of audiences that are accessing this um, scholarly information that we're previously un un unable to access. Healthcare systems, public health authorities. So the New York City Public Health Authority um, IP address has um, had 560 downloads of annual reviews 
um, articles, annual reviews of public health articles, since this went open. Beforehand, zero. These are the people that are responsible for maintaining public health in one of the biggest um, cities in, in the world, the biggest in the United States. It's, it's a big deal that they are able to access this stuff now. I won't go through the whole list. Um, I'll draw your attention to the last line. We've seen uh, departments of the, Premier, of the uh, Premier in many different countries, Mexico, Israel, Italy, and so on, uh, using this cabinet ministers in different places, all sorts of UN organizations, um, Doctors Without Borders, Amnesty International, Planned Parenthood. This has become a publicly useful resource, I think. Um, so that was the first thing that we wanted to determine, what would be the impact of opening uh, things up. Before open access, approximately up to 2,000 institutional subscribers. Afterwards, to the extent that we can resolve IP addresses, there are 12,000 institutional um, uh, users of, 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 of the content, not to mention um, many tens of thousands of individuals using their Verizon account or whatever. Um, I want to give you um, an idea of who is using the Annual Review of Public Health in Ireland. Previously, this was available only at the, is it seven universities that are part of the, um, of the uh, uh, purchasing consortium here. But now we've got, um, beyond that, the ESRI, the Health Services Executive, you probably won't believe it, but Dublin City Council are looking at um, annual review of public health, RTE, the Department of Health, Agriculture, Food and the Marine. I did a quick look at Northern Ireland as well. And again, the Department of Agriculture and the Northern Ireland Assembly had uh, shown a handful of downloads, as well as the universities that are part of the IRELT consortium. All 11 of the institutes of technology in Ireland have accessed in reasonable quantities, and it's varied. I mean, one of them, I think, only had five or six downloads, but some of them are uh, well into the... Um, uh, scores of, of, of uses of this content. So it's genuinely uh, been um, influential in, in, in Ireland, I think. Uh, when we founded this out, we had to decide how we could, how to move to open access. There are a number of options. One was article processing charges, which is the main way that um, certainly in the biomedical field people pay for open access. The uh, publisher will send you a bill and, and uh, to nominally cover what it would cost to publish. Um, we did not see that as a good option for annual reviews, partly because we invite our um, contributors to write for annual reviews and they have to spend three or four months doing huge literature searches and, and putting together their article. It didn't seem appropriate to then send them a bill to publish it. Um, also, because of the way our content is structured, the APC um, price would be very, very high. So, for instance, I'm really in Ireland for a meeting of the annual review of the editorial committee of um, the editorial committee of nuclear and particle science. Um, there's people coming from various parts of the world to Dublin to participate in that meeting, and annual reviews pays for that, and all their flights and their meals and so on are ultimately costs of of um, of, of publishing and and would be part of the APC. So it would be quite a large chart. So that, that's really out. And there's other reasons to do with fairness that APCs are not good. Um, read and publish is quite a popular model at the moment. It doesn't work for us because it tends to focus on... Um, our, our experts are often at leading institutions, so I don't know, maybe 30 or 40 research institutions are responsible for 10% of our content, something like that. that would, if, if all those institutions were responsible for paying for open access, the burden would fall on them. But the readership is very broad, as I showed in, in the last slide, potentially very, very broad. And we don't want the burden for paying for it to fall on a few wealthy institutions. We would rather a lot of people made small contributions than a few institutions make very large con con contributions. My response at the time when we were doing this was to seek support from funders. I thought, uh, you know, we needed about $15 million a year. I thought I could identify 30 funding agencies, um, 10 in the US, 10 in Europe, and 10 in the rest of the world, and ask them all to give us half a million dollars a year um, 
and there would be some contract that where we would have to deliver a certain quality of, of, of content and certain usage numbers. Uh, and then they would be getting what I would have considered to be the bargain of the century for half a million dollars. They would have access to all this content. Never got very far with that. Um, I'd probably not be here today if we had pursued it because of all the red tape. Because we, um, uh, as part of that Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, uh, we hired a consultant and I sat down with him. The first time I met him, he described this model of subscribe to open um, that I immediately saw as being the right way forward for us. And that's to leverage the existing relationships and systems of um, uh, how publishers and librarians work together. The good aspects of how publishers and librarians work together. So we've come up with this program that we call Subscribe to Open. We are looking for our existing customers who know and value annual reviews content to continue to subscribe. So we want Helen to continue to subscribe to annual reviews content on behalf of Trinity researchers and uh, Trinity students. And in, if they do so, we'll uh, offer these uh, journals at a 5% discount. So there's an actual saving on the budget there. When we get commitments from all our subscribers, we'll publish the volume under a Creative Commons license and remove the paywall to all previous volumes. Um, if we don't receive enough support, so if some libraries decide that they would take the chance of free riding, that will kind of bring the house of cards down uh, because there, there won't be enough funding for us to go ahead with the Subscribe to Open program. Then the content will not be published open access and the holdouts will um, be asked to subscribe at the full rate. People who have committed to the subscribe to open rate will still get the discount. I do not think that will happen, but that's the kind of stick. There has to be a carrot and a stick. And the stick is, well, if you don't do it, you're going to not only not be able to get access to the stuff yourself, you're going to stop all sorts of other people getting it as well. The offer is repeated every year, um, keeps us on our toes. And at the same time, we'll monitor usage and try to attract new subscribers. So, for instance, the New York Department of Public Health, we'll certainly be knocking on their door. Um, 600 or so um, downloads in the past couple of years. Surely the New York um, Department of Public Health would see their way clear to giving some hundreds or a thousand dollars towards the cost of, um, of paying for such a title. It's a sort of guardian newspaper model. If you value it, then pay a little bit towards it. And we think in that way that we may be able to bring the cost of subscriptions down for everyone. So it's not just a, a, a neutral um, uh, cost here. If we can get more people involved in paying for it, smaller amounts will be paid. Of course, that also requires that we are open in our business practices and we're happy to be. I could imagine other companies looking at this and saying, well, great, we can just charge more and, and make more. And that's not really, that's not what we are planning to do. So we're moving ahead with this project in 2020 with five titles as our pilot type, as our pilot project. We've selected those titles fairly carefully. The annual review of public health is in there because it's the one that we've done all the experimentation with in, in the opening stages. Um, environment and resources is the one that has a lot of climate change um, content and we think that that's important to have that freely available. Similarly with cancer biology, you know, there are a lot of cancer physicians at um, hospitals and um, that don't have access to annual reviews and we think it might be of some use to them so we want to make it available to them. Political science is in there because we felt it was important to include at least one um, social sciences uh, um, title in the in the group and nuclear and particle science the group that are meeting here or tomorrow is in there because most research published in physics is already freely available through a program called scope 3 and we want to be consistent with that so we'll see how that goes um, the features of subscribe to open are it uses the conventional subscription processes the existing library budget, so you don't have to find new money to pay for APCs or to top up in, in any way. It retains the curation function of the librarians. So instead of the researchers taking responsibility for what they want to spend money on, they want to give 
eight thousand dollars to nature or whatever you, you'll be still in charge of the budget and deciding on how best to curate the library's content on behalf of all scholars uh, we provide an incentive through the lower subscription cost and importantly in the us this is not a donation it's a subscription it's a subscription in the same way that told access subscriptions are if you don't pay the subscription the system won't work that way so um, that's an important um, maybe not so important in europe but in the united states very important where you've got some crazy Republican senator wondering why the university is making a donation to annual reviews. Well, it's not a donation, it's a subscription. Maybe not a crazy one, but a Republican. <laughs> um, I want to say that um, IRL was the very first organization to voice support for Subscribe to Open. And for that, we are very grateful and very happy. And there was a press release put out that said, IRL welcomes this opportunity to make these titles open access on a cost-neutral basis to people outside our member institutions, including students and staff in all Irish higher education institutes. And as I said, all the technology institutions have uh, seen decent usage of public health and we'll make data available on um, the access for all five um, pilot journals. Uh, as of the 1st of October, I meant to get in touch with our sales director yesterday to update this, but as of the 1st of October, we had 137 orders for 2020. Um, 67 of them are for collections, 72 are for individual titles, and no one um, withdrew from the subscribe to open titles. Not only that, but we've been contacted by two institutions, and I think now three, that have said we, don't, we haven't been subscribing to these um, titles but we really want to support open access, so we are now going to become subscribers. And somewhat humblingly, we were contacted <coughs> by an institution in Bangladesh saying that they wanted to contribute, not realizing that we actually make content freely available to them anyway. So we don't, I'm not sure whether we're going to take that contribution or not, but it's very sort of humbling to see it. So, so far, we've had no co cancellations, and I think it's going to work. Uh, the potential next steps is um, I've been talking to our board about adding more titles in 2021 uh, if it's a decisive success. Uh, we need to continue to learn and evolve the approach so it's great for me to be here and get feedback from, from users and from librarians on, on what they think we should be doing. We want to exchange information with all interested parties. There's been a lot of uh, interest from other publishers in what we're doing and other pilots are in process as well at other companies. Um, I want to talk about developing content that builds on the reviews. If I've got time, I don't know what time it is now. Um, and we are keen to participate in the wider goals of open scholarship. I think that that's part of our mission to see what we can do to make scholarship more open for more people to use. And essentially, this is a fully in um, in line with the mission of the organization. So that's subscribe to open. Uh, I just briefly mentioned these three other areas which we are engaging in to transform an annual reviews to a public good. There are copies of this knowable magazine. There's a website as well, um, which these um, are journalist written stories are also published on a CC by license. Um, there's the Knowable website itself, and then we have a whole range of republication partners, which includes um, the Washington Post, the Atlantic Magazine, Smithsonian, um, Scientific American, BBC Future. There's, there's a whole range of them. In fact, one of the things I'd quite like to do when I'm here, if I can find the time, is to speak to the chap at the Irish Times to see if I can get him interested in posting some of the content on, on the Irish Times site. Um, the content's generally, I think, very strong. Um, the print publication we're going to do three times a year. I'd love to speak to the science gallery people here and see if they would like to distribute it. Uh, we'll provide copies to them and they can give it out there. And to the science galleries around the world. Um, so this, again, just summarizes what we're doing. CC BY, um, we republish. It increases the audience substantially. When we do that, we make the related annual reviews articles freely available so people can take a deep dive. And something like one in 20 people that read the uh, 
knowable article. Actually click on, I can't tell you that they read the annual reviews article, but they at least click on it and are aware that there's that resource available. We're currently developing editions in Chinese, Spanish, Brazilian and Arabic to reach uh, more global audience. The next thing that we would like to do, and we're just in the planning stages of the first of these, is what we are calling Spark events. I'm not sure if that will be the, the end term. This um, picture here shows uh, the kind of gap between primary research and action impacts, and that's action impacts at a local level, I think. Um, there's lots of research being done. Some of it does find its way through to policy and action, but maybe a lot of it which could do and which could be impacting policy more quickly is, is being lost along the way. Reviews are one stage in the process. We think we can go from reviews to events to developing some kind of uh, knowledge-based website to influence policy and to influence local um, decision-making. And by local, um, at the United States level, that would be uh, both at the level of the state of California and at the city level. Um, this is obviously from a different presentation, not one that I gave, but someone else at annual reviews. Um, these Spark events are going to be two-day interdisciplinary meetings. There will be, we're already arranging the first one, it's going to be on agriculture in California. How Californian agriculture can benefit from climate change is the tentative title. We want to try and flip the idea that everything is all going to be bad. Of course, it's going to be bad in the in the round, but the, what are the areas where where things can be done better as a result of climate change? And we want to draw on um, academia, industry, uh, policy tank, and think tank people, governments. Uh, we're talking to Jerry Brown, the former governor, who's setting up an institute on climate change to see if he would be interested. And so they'll be focused on prominent regional issues. I suspect that we'll do the second one um, maybe in Chile, in South America, and try and move them around the, the world and get a non-California-centric view of things, which is one problem of living in the US, and especially in California, is that it's, people find it hard to see that there are other places doing interesting things, and we really need to try and tap into that. So we want the leading researchers, what we provide is the leading researchers to give the scientific background, but we want to engage them with civic leaders and use workshops to break down the communication barriers. And we want policy uh, recommendations and actions to come out of these events. It'd be great to do one in Dublin in two or three years time when we've sorted out exactly what they are. And on the back of these things, we want to develop um, stable networks, knowledge action networks. Um, translation is more than just expressing ideas in an accessible way. You really need to trust and be involved with the people that, that you want to that you want to influence. Um, so communities are more likely to act when their assessments <clears throat> transmit the motivation as well as the science. Uh, I think that this is really important that we try to draw communities in. And you know, the uh, Extinction Rebellion people up the road are exactly the right group for us to be talking with. They should be, I don't know if they are, but they should be on the campus all the time talking to scientists about what scientists are finding out and what they're thinking and so on. There's a real, there's a real commonality of, of, um, of, of goals between the two groups, I think. So long as they stick to the science, if they, if they don't, then obviously things will move apart. But at least from what I've seen of them, it's a terrifically uh, science-friendly movement, and I think we should be excited by it. So um, we need to pull in other people as well, uh, the people that are in between the scientists at one end and um, rebellion Extinction Rebellion on the other side, and that's um, people that are professionals, people that are making policy, people that are funding, people in the media, and so on. So the idea is just to try and draw that, draw those together. And um, that may be as much as I have to say. Yeah, in conclusion, uh, it's in the public interest to understand and to legislate uh, using science and to use scholarship uh, as much as they possibly can. We see annual reviews as 
have been in a position to make some small contribution to this, building bridges between research and uh, the wider society. We're really enthusiastic about not trying to do this on our own, but building partnerships that can advance research and benefit society. So maybe that's something that we can talk about. I, we think that the relationship that we have with um, librarians is very important, and we want to strengthen it and through Subscribe to Open. I think that's one way of doing so. so that's all I have to say. Thanks.